Today, my mission is I'm going to take you into the weeds and show you how the sausage is made a little bit in the lab. And we'll, uh, I'm going to talk to you for a while, give you a death by PowerPoint for a bit. Um, I will apologize right up front. I have way too many slides than we should logically see in the next 45 minutes. But that's OK, because many of them will be like, oh, yeah, I know that. But what I'm going to do is we're done. I'm going to give these to you. And you will have fodder to develop your own lectures to keep get the message in your language how you want. So keep that in mind that you don't have to really take a lot of notes. You'll get this stuff. And I have more if you want it. So it's all about getting the message out. So um, I put other co-authors up there with me because it takes a village. We can't do this alone. But I'm going to tell you about uh, drones and ice cores and flasks and what they can teach us about Greenland and the planet. So part of that village is um, this crew here. And Jim, because you saw him yesterday, it's like right in the center here. Um, you're going to see a lot of pictures of people up here, because I want to let you know that science has a face. This is not some sort of dry academic thing that comes churning out of a printer. These are real people asking real questions, doing real science. And what we're going to talk about today is ice cores and uh, some of the issues surrounding um, water vapor in Greenland. But just to let you know, our lab is involved in a lot of other different areas. If there's time and interest downstairs, we'll touch on some of them. But um, primarily, we do ice cores and trace gases in the atmosphere, which we'll talk about more in the lab. Um, so of that crew, these are the people that are still in Greenland right now. So that is tells you a little bit about the, the uh, level of our effort there. I'm communicating with them daily, and as crises come and go, um, they're having a great time. So I will just have one or two slides here as a shout out to our, our real bread and butter of the lab. When you go downstairs, you'll see seven or eight mass spectrometers and a lot of compressed gases. It's sort of intimidating. But most of that is in support of our collaboration with the NOAA uh, Climate Monitoring Diagnostics Lab in South Boulder, who maintains this network of collecting pairs of these glass flasks and all these sites all around the world every week. And we basically have our finger on the pulse of the atmosphere and where it's going with regard to greenhouse gases. And they measure all the levels of CO2 and methane and a whole list of compounds along with your arm. And then they, by courier, send them over to our lab. We measure the stable isotopes of these. And we'll get into that later, but <clears throat> isotopes are great tracers of uh, uh, sources and sinks of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, I should point out, this is our bragging right that we, along with this crew, measure about 25,000 uh, ice health measurements on greenhouse gases every year. So it's a high precision, high throughput lab. OK, <clears throat> the next few slides are sort of the pedantic kind of uh, 101, going back to chemistry. You know, all know this, what's an isotope. But just a way to think about it is uh, heavier and lighter molecules that, um, that allow us to exploit this in nature. And that's everything we do downstairs, is we exploit stable isotopes in the environment. That's what makes it such a fun lab to work in, because you never know what's going to come walking through the door. We've analyzed everything from lizard's breath to carbonates to pine needles to ice cores or trace gases. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a few of those examples. But the big picture, stabilized the environment have four sort of key um, roles for us, that they are great integrators of physical processes in space and time. Uh, they indicate the presence and magnitude of processes in the environment. They're a great record of responses to the Earth's changing environmental condition, which you've seen in ice cores, and you'll see more of today. And they're great tracers in the atmosphere. It's kind of like almost like a red dot in toss in the atmosphere. It's that good. Um, a little bit about nomenclature. I won't do all this, but this is, again, for your slide quiver. Um, just explaining what the delta value is. You'll see things. If, how many you know what a per mil like ice cores? No, Nomenclature is that familiar territory? Yes, no? Okay, we're we're not a bunch <laughs> in the ice up world. And we don't measure things absolutely, we measure things relative to another substance. So we all have to agree on a standard, and then we report our, our measurements relative to that standard. So standards and calibrations are really big to us, but basically we take the ratio of the abundance of the rare isotope to the common isotopes. An example for oxygen is oxygen 18 divided by oxygen 16. This is the, the abundance in any one molecule. And then that gives you a ratio. And then we take the ratio of the sample to and compare it to a standard, subtract one, multiply by 1,000, you have what we call a delta value. 
kind of convoluted, but when you get into it, it's an a easier shorthand than reporting things to many decimal places. It's just like minus, you know, 113 per mil for deuterium for boulder water. It's just a little bit easier. So I want to take a few slides and say, why does the paleo thermometer in an ice core work? How do we get there? Um, most of the water in the atmosphere, as you know, uh, stems from evaporation at lower latitudes from the ocean. That water is more or less in equilibrium with that ocean water in terms of its abundance of oxygen 16 to 18, or deuterium. Uh, same story. So the cloud more or less reflects kind of what the concentration of the water is. But we know that this cloud is made up of heavier and lighter molecules, and the way the kinetic properties work is those heavier isotopes are going to want to condense out first, and what's left in the cloud is isotopically lighter. If that makes sense. So that cloud travels further and further towards the poles, in this case, uh, towards Antarctica, the world's upside down here, and more and more of those heavier isotopes rain out. And what we have is a relationship between the isotopic signature of that precipitation and temperature which is pretty amazing. Nature doesn't always give us these nice relationships to exploit. But this is why we can stand on ice cores and say, it's real, it's temperature, and it works. And you can correlate isotopes and ice core records with modern day instrumental records for average annual temperature, and there's a correlation. The guy on whose shoulders we stand, go ahead. I have a question. Is this based on measurements of cloud droplets, or just water vapor in the cloud? Both. So if you were to, you could do this in an experiment, you could measure the water vapor in the cloud. The vapor is getting isotopically lighter and you're losing the heavier water molecules out the bottom as snow or rain. So maybe the particles are forming the droplets? That's a whole other conversation about you know aerosols and condensation nuclei and what causes the water to condense out of the cloud in the first place. But in those processes, there'll be a preference for the heavier isotope to condense first. All right. So fractionation. Um, the guy who uh, really sort of was the grandfather of this, uh, besides Jim, uh, was a guy named Willy Dansgaard, who in Denmark, um, he measured stable isotopes and he started uh, science with a beer bottle and collected precipitation in his backyard and started measuring the isotopic concentration of different storm fronts as they came through and he noticed changes and differences and started to think more about this and what this meant he realized this hey, we could do stuff with this. So just to show you how real this is, here's a map of the United States in looking at precipitation samples isotopically, and you'll notice some really clear trends. So that cloud we're talking about that moved from the lower latitudes, it came over a continent, it's raining out the heavier isotopes here, and by the time it gets to the high plateau of the Rockies, it's isotopically lighter. So this makes what we call an isoscape, and we can exploit that. Um, we exploit it in ice cores, but there's a dozen different ways isotopes are used that are kind of fun when you're explaining examples of why isotopes rock. One of those is food authenticity. Um, if you're going to try to sell me an a orange or orange juice from a Florida, you say it's a Florida orange, isotopically we can measure that, we can see where it plots, and we can say, nah, -uh, that's in California, don't try to fool me. Uh, same thing with apples, same thing with uh, olive oil, maple syrup, cocaine, drugs. Um, the people in the Tour de France, uh, Lance Armstrong and Floyd Landis, they were busted because the isotopic signature, the carbon-13 signature of the steroids in their body was fingerprinted to a synthetic, not to their body's natural thing. So it's a forensic tool. You can do all kinds of cool things with it. So don't do drugs. Right? <laughs> 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 you get busted. So here's Willie, late great Willie, we lost him in 2011. Here he is smoking. Water. We don't do that anymore. Um, but here is his famous plot from this paper in 1964. And tell us, it's sort of like the Bible for isotope uh, in ice cores. Here's a relationship of plotting average annual temperature and the average um, isotopic signature of precipitation at various sites around the world. And here's this beautiful line. This is why temperature and ice cores work. It's that simple, and uh, it's as good as if you were standing on a glacier measuring temperature every year for 100,000 years. It'd get kind of old, but it's uh, there's some caveats to it. We can get 
changes from you know sources of moisture that come from different areas. But by and large, this is a very robust relationship that allows us to do the paleoclimate science that we do. So as snow falls, um, you guys might have covered some of this yesterday at Nickel, but basically we have terminology. Um, we call this snow, we call this fern, and we call this ice. What distinguishes those things is really about the density and the space in between things. Up here, the snowflakes, like the powder snow we love to ski in, it's got spaces between the snowflakes. Uh, lots of air between those flakes. As that gets compressed by subsequent layers above it, it starts to densify. Now, those holes between the snow grains are still there, and they communicate with the surface. So the age of the air in this ice is going to be younger than the ice itself, because it's changing with the atmosphere. So if you ever hear the term ice age, gas age, that's what that's talking about. And at some certain point, the density gets so great that these pores close off. They no longer communicate with the surface. surface and these little spaces, these interstitial spaces, are trapped bubbles. They're time capsules of the atmosphere from that time. And people, we don't do it in our lab, but people in other labs can actually uh, shave the ice or melt the ice and measure the amount of CO2 or this amount of air in general, and look at uh, various gases and give them insights to other processes in nature and the atmosphere going back in time. So when you see those plots that Jim showed you yesterday with CO2 and temperature, the temperature comes from the stable isotopes of water, and the CO2 comes from these trapped bubbles. Make sense? Okay, so basically, I call this a library of snowfall, and that's what it really is. We're going back and we're reading history, and trouble is there aren't page numbers, so we like to go to places where there's no likely a low probability of surface melt, because uh, if there is, did you lose five pages or a hundred? You know, so you lose a layer. Um, we like to go to places where um, there's no surface melt, and that's, for that reason, polar ice cores are kind of the gold standard. There's ice on the glaciers and Tibetan Plateau and the Rockies, wherever, but these are temperate glaciers that are a little more difficult to interpret because they, they, they melt more periodically, although we're finding that Greenland is not as cold as it should be. So uh, Lauren Isley once said, if there's magic on the planet, it's containing water. I love this quote because it's so magic. And I said, uh, maybe it's stable ice. <laughs> um, but in the field, what this looks like is here's a snow pit that's been dug, and then we've excavated around it so sunlight can sort of penetrate this thin wall that's maybe you know, that thick. And you can actually see these layers. And so a year's worth of accumulation might be something like this, but here are individual storm layers, surface or uh, lots of, this is the history book right here that will get interpreted uh, through the ice cores. You guys got a chance to cut ice cores yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So this is not news to you how we do this. Um, it's like we're going to a party and this is the pie that gets split up between all the labs. Um, the gas people get a big chunk because they, like, they need a lot of air for their measurements. Uh, if you think of some measurement that we should have been measuring but didn't, or you developed a new instrument that can give us insight, uh, there's an archive waiting for you. You just have to write a proposal to OSF and get permission, and you can go down and analyze that ice. Um, the chemistry people take an extra quick chunk. We actually need very little water. And uh, I don't know if Jim talked about this yesterday, but in the old days we used to cut things in a bandsaw, take a little sample of ice, melt it, pipette it, decant it, put it on two different mass specs, and like five years later, and a lot more gray hair, we'd have a record. We do things differently now. Um, we take a stick of ice from a meter, and we actually uh, melt it. And uh, what, that ha what that looks like, and you'll see it downstairs, is here's a little stick of ice, about 13 millimeters square. It's inside of a, stored inside of an acrylic tube. It's vertically mounted. And you see a whole carousel of these downstairs that are one by one rotated over this little hole in the platter here. And beneath that hole is a little dish that's kept warmer than the freezer. And this ice stick slowly melts. And there's a drain here with peristaltic pumps to pull that water out. And then we put it into a laser that measures stable isotopes using laser spectroscopy, which we'll talk about later. Um, but it's a faster, better, cheaper, lighter way of measuring stable isotopes. That the mass specs that Jim and I used to measure water on each cost with their prep system maybe a quarter million dollars were bigger than each of these tables and it took a very skilled technician to run. This is about $80,000 and there's one button right here. I mean, it's a more complicated than that, but basically it's tremendously simplified. The precision and the accuracy has gone up a whole lot. 
So what that's allowed us to do is take sticks of ice like this, and we're even doing this in the field at East Grip as we speak. We, are, we have a melter system set up that's melting the ice and bringing it into a warm room where the people are and uh, creating a record right in the field. So when we come home, our job is done. So we already have the record. So um, Bragg and Rice, this is a revolution of high resolution ice cores and records. It's opened up a whole new cottage industry of analysis of paleo climate. So the olden days of the bandsaw method of cutting up little pieces, we would get maybe 20, 25 samples per meter. And you know, the surface, that's not too many here, but as you go deeper, that represents a lot of time. So we're averaging over a lot. So our, our, the, the focus of our lenses gets a little foggy and we're kind of averaging. Well, with this method, this is a one hertz instrument. It takes me about 40 minutes to melt through a stick of ice. So what that happens is, we instead of getting 20, 25 measurements per meter, I now get about 2,400 data points per meter. So what this allows us is to really never lose sight of any sort of aberration or climatic variation in the ice core whatsoever. Um, and how good is it? Well, here's a section in the Antarctic ice core from 1160 to 1180. So there's 20 meters here. And you can see these cycles in here. If you blow up just two meters of those, these are summer and winter cycles in different isotopes. But you can see that you know there's a winter, it's summer, winter, summer. We're counting annual isotopic signals back um, probably you know several uh, at least down to 1,100 meters. So it's it works. Um, and what that's allowed us to produce more bragging rights is the world's highest resolution isotopic record from ice core. These are over 8 million data points. And you think, well, what did you really learn? There's just this kind of broad thing here. Couldn't you average it and get the story? Sure, big picture. But if you drill in there, you will see all these things, which have given us great windows into how abruptly climate can change, how quickly, and what other constituents are doing relative to that uh, can tell us just volumes. Um, and our own postdoc, Tyler Jones, published a paper comparing Greenland and Antarctic ice cores and uh, their phasing and how that worked out through spectral analysis, which was no longer, or was previously not possible until we had these methods, and it took the cover of nature uh, last year. So um, I want to talk a little bit about Greenland, because that's where I've just come from. And I've been going there since the late 80s, and um, there's change. Um, if you go to this uh, polarportal.dk, Thank you for reminding me to turn my phone off. Um, this is uh, the Danish Meteorological Office maintains this website. It's updated daily. And uh, as of the June 23rd, here is the percentage of the Greenland ice sheet that is currently melting in this red area. And if you look at this plot down here, this shows you the mean. And we're going in 2019. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what does. Um, 2012 was a big melt year. I predict this year is going to be as big or bigger. Um, they also have a way of calculating mass changes, and here is the, the trend for mass of the ice sheet. But you can see most of this along the west coast where the outlet streams are. Um, the Akasabi Glacier that probably produced the iceberg that sank the Titanic is sort of in this area. Uh, still a prolific producer of, of icebergs. So, we're all concerned. Greenland's warming, Antarctica's warming. Um, we want to track this stuff. How fast? Um, because a lot of these relationships are not linear. <clears throat> and there's hidden non-linearities in the climate system that we're only beginning to understand. So there may be thresholds, tipping points, um, all the more reason to watch this stuff very carefully. The analogy I like to use is we're walking along the railroad tracks. We see this bright light coming down the tracks. Could be a train, could be something else. We don't know. We can argue about what it is and maybe when it get off the tracks, but we would never take our eye off the light on that coming towards us to know is it accelerating, is it decelerating? And that's what I'm talking about. Let's keep our eye on the light. And we do that in Greenland using satellites to measure um, surface elevation, surface velocities, elevation changes, and mass balance. Um, we can measure meltwater streams. We can look at how fast it's melting. Here's some data from this satellite by uh, Dorothy Hall. 
uh, in last year, published a paper and using data from Avaris, or MODIS actually, they were looking at melt seasons. And you can see that here's the 2012, the year, we're probably gonna have another year like that. So these things change and vary on their natural cycles, but calving is um, one of the major ways we lose ice. Uh, melting is another. Um, I know something about calving. Um, back in the 80s, I was involved in uh, looking at Columbia Glacier in Alaska, and that is actually me right there. Wow. Um, <laughs> my boss dropped me off, and they promised to pick me up, and I'm really glad they did. <laughs> So anyway, um, let's go to Greenland. This is how we get there. I think you're going to learn about how you, we get there in very tomorrow next year. Yeah. Did you say the word calving? Calving. Yeah. Calving, as in uh, a cow having a calf. So calving. this is a term for icebergs that cleave off of a, an ice sheet or a glacier, and then they're in the ocean. And so it's a, a calving. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's easy to lapse into jargon without explaining it. So thank you for that. Um, I think you have, Luis, isn't there a part of your studies in the next couple days that talks about C-130s? Yeah, um, Je Jesse Jenkins is talking about Arctic and Elaine's talking about Antarctic and then they're also talking about how to bring the ice cores back tomorrow on ASC. You'll probably see more about these, but these are amazing. This is the workhorse of the polar regions. These are run by the 109th Air National Guard out of New York. They're owned a lot by the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's how we get there. You'll see that they combine with wheels or skis and then there's uh, Genesis to take off the wheel. The rear door drops down. You can drive a tank in the back of these things. Um, I should point out that's how our cargo gets there. And the way they offload the cargo is they taxi, they slow down, they taxi, they go out the rear gate, and they push the pallets out the back. They call it a combat offload. I've got a video of it. It's pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Um, a little anecdote from this year. I don't know if I told you yet, but. Uh, these instruments, these later instruments, we take them in the field. They're kind of sensitive, they're expensive, and uh, we don't combat offload those. Mm -hmm. We pan carry them, we call it loose load. So I was on the put-in team, and when this plane lands, there's no prepared skiway. It's landing in open snow. So the pilots are a little nervous, and they want to get out of there. And uh, so they dump your car out the back, they dump you out the back, and we offload our very sensitive instruments. Not only during the season, there's skidoos and a whole fleet of sleds that'll come and pick you and your stuff up and welcome you and take you to the nice warm dome. That ain't happening when we get there. It's like, we have shovels, we gotta dig in, and the pilots wanna leave, and so our field leader, through a lack of communication, communicated with pilots that yes, we have a sat phone connection with the outside world, you're good to go. Okay. Our stuff was still behind the aircraft. Wow. And they didn't just give it a little goose to kind of get going like they would on a taxiway. They had to give it like full throttle on the ground to get the skis out of the snow. Well, the stuff in the blast zone, I watched from the dome as three Picaros, one of which was borrowed, went foo 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 for 100 yards. My heart just sank. And I thought, I'm not supposed to get on the plane the whole. My field season's <laughs> over. Uh, my drone field work relies on the drone, or surface snow burns rely on, uh, for rely on these instruments, and their ice core relies on it. If they're all broken, Game over. So I spent two days before the dome warmed, warmed up and I could actually bring the instruments and test them, kind of going, oh man, this is horrible, this is horrible. You know, the grant, I'm never going to, one by one, I fired them off <laughs> and they work beautifully. Nice. Um, I was just like, crazy as hell, you I'm a believer. And I thought, I'm going to call Carl and give him a testimonial. And I thought, maybe not. Uh, so problems down the line to say, well, you know. <laughs> so they do survive a lot. You didn't want to know that, did you? You are in such trouble. <laughs> okay, Dad. Um, so where is where is East Grip? It's here. All these dots represent ice cores that we have been involved with, or many of them, not all, over the years. And uh, currently, this is at the head of a large ice stream that we'll show more of later. Um, this is what a tipping drill looks like. Have you guys seen pictures of drill at Nickel probably already? Yeah. Oh, can't say Nickel. National Ice Core. Ice Core facility. facility. I see it. <laughs> Two decades of Nickel, and it's going to take a long time to encourage that one. Um, so that's where ESCRIP is. Um, I won't dwell on this too long, but this is, uh, this is the map of velocities, ice velocities. So this is a streaming feature that's going out this way. This likely, there's no bedrock topography that sort of channels this ice to do this. It's probably a result of some geothermal heat flux up here, 
We're going to find out <clears throat> as we drill. These are maps of velocities across these transects. And the more important one here is you can see that as you come down this line here, the B line, parallel with the ice flow, it speeds up to something like 80 meters a day. What does that mean? That means our camp is moving about this much every day. Did I say a day? 80 meters a year, sorry. 80 meters a year. So every day is moving about 15 centimeters. This will become important later, but uh, we've been working with, Jim and I have been working with this Danish couple, Jordan Dahl Jensen and uh, Hans Peter Stephenson for, since dirt, since late 80s or so. Um, there is a strong connection between Denmark and Instar, and we, uh, yeah, they've been, they're like the king and queen of Danish ice courts, and we love working with them, and it's, uh, international collaboration is great. And being in camp, we'll show you pictures later, is a very international experience. Um, so there's, there's that line. What's it like to be there? Um, this is the life above the surface. This is our dome we built in 2010, I think. At another location, we dragged it 350 kilometers with a pistol motor. So this site here, it's, it houses a kitchen and a workroom and a cupola, and then everything else is in seasonal weather ports that come up and down mostly. And then below uh, the surface are these trenches that we've dug, and we now inhabit with our uh, uh, our ice cores. And this is a drill here, and uh, this is an aerial shot showing you the dome. Um, sort of a carpenter's garage, various mechanic shelters. This is the entrance to the tunnels going down a ramp. These tunnels, by the way, are made by um, mother of all snow plows in the front of a piston bully that throws snow out like snow like you wouldn't believe. They make a trench about mm, 20 feet wide, about 100 meters long, and they fill it with a balloon, a big balloon that looks like a submarine, inflate it, and then they blow the snow back on top, and they wait until the snow sinters for several days, and then they deflate the balloon, you've got this beautiful, strong tunnel. And when they first did it, it was sort of a novel thing, and everyone's kind of a little nervous about it. But to prove their point, they drove the snowcat, the piston bully, over the top of it. And it's like, why would you do that? <laughs> the, the risks you face are tremendous. But they proved the point that it's strong, it works, and um, yeah, that's how we've been doing it. So this is another graph of the mass loss of Greenland. And this kind of drives on the point. I put this here just for your quiver. It shows you, um, you can go to this site on NASA, and it'll actually be a movie here. The program is run by Mike Watkins. And this is the Grace Satellite. Has anyone heard of the Grace Satellite before? Is it not the coolest thing ever? Yeah. So for those of you who don't realize, it's like the Earth is not homogeneous in its density, right? There's small variations of gravity. You can actually map this, and I did this as a young man using a, an instrument like this. Now we have satellites, because I carried this around and made gravity points like that. Um, they have two satellites that track each other, and as they approach, let's say this is a heavy mass, this satellite will be accelerated before this one. And as they pass over it, this one will be accelerated, and then this one will you know, de-accelerate. So the space between them varies as a function of the mass beneath them. Does that make sense? So they have lasers between satellites tracking their distance apart to like the angstrom. And make, taking that distance apart, they can uh, infer what the mass change or mass that's being affected by on the surface. And you could do this over time. You could sense things like the Amazon Basin River or Amazon Basin water levels rising and lowering, and they can track the mass of the green light sheet. Who thought of this? It's just amazing to me. I think it's just phenomenal. Um, they also have satellites that measure water vapor. This is again from Dorothy Hall looking at which is uh, in 2015, June, July, August, September, you see things very rapidly. Um, one of the things I'm going to harp on is the motivation for our drone experience there is we talk about glaciers melting, we talk about glaciers calving. Those are two big mass loss mechanisms. There's another one that's smaller, but it's not insignificant, and that is direct sublimation. That is like when you leave an ice cube in your refrigerator for a year and it disappears, where does it go? It's just, just direct solid and vapor change. So too does my, the Greenland ice sheet collect vapor deposition from the atmosphere or, or sublimation. And we want to know how much, how fast, how long, and how that's varying. Um, there are models that sort of make estimates for that. This is from Weber in 2016, sort of postulated that there might be as much as 200 grams per square uh, meter of uh, water equivalent, basically vapor flux. That's not trivial. 
So that's, depending on the model and how you bump it in, that could be anywhere from 6 to 18% of the mass. So very few measurements really address this directly. Satellites infer it, but we want to provide them ground truth. We want to better understand the transfer function of the atmosphere to the ice sheet, because after all, we're measuring the ice stuff in the ice core, we're taking that as gospel for what the climate was. But really, that's a record of precipitation events. And climate happens between precipitation events. So this conversation we thought was just the atmosphere telling the ice sheet what climate history was, is really a two-way conversation. The ice sheet affects the atmosphere as well. And so um, I have colleagues in Norway, Hans Christian Steen Larsen here, handsome lad, um, is making these really painstaking detailed measurements of the snow surface and how they evolved and over time isotopically. Because there's a lot of variability. They get affected by daily events. And here, you can see that um, this is the surface snow isotope measurements here, varying over time. These are precipitation events here. Now, kind of keep your eye on the bars. And we're just going to focus on the times in between the precipitation events. And these are the water vapor isotope measurements taken on a tower above the surface. And what you'll notice is they are tracking the snow surface. So they're talking. This conversation we're just beginning to listen into, and it's kind of whispering to us right now, but we feel it has a lot to tell us. And so, you know, ice score isotopes are not only governed by precipitation, but what controls the water vapor isotope flux between the snowpack and the atmosphere. And, and how important is that? Does it really change our interpretation of the ice cores? My prediction is Willie Dansgaard's not going to roll over in his grave and have his fist <laughs> in the air, but it may actually make our understanding of the climate signal in the ice cores even more robust that we may be able to tease out more information. So we partnered with um, Hans Christian and our graduate student, uh, Abby Thayer, is also involved in this project. While they're measuring detailed snow measurements and uh, measurements over the tower, um, which can be seen here, these are, this is time going this way. These are averaged over um, several different days. And we're looking at humidity in blue um, isotopes in red, and then the temperature in one meter. And so there's this diurnal cycle. This is an average signal we're seeing here. Do we see changes in the isotopes? We see changes in the, in the temperature, and we see changes in humidity. But you'll notice these curves are not exactly one to one. So if you put these into a model, um, like the French model, you can see that with height above the ice sheet and the isotopes, both the humidity and the isotopes change with different curves. So they're carrying different information. It's not just one is a direct function of the other. So we want to exploit that to try to get a handle on the mass flux between the atmosphere and the ice sheet. I won't talk too much about that because it kind of gets in the modeling world. And I'm more of a measurement guy, but this is Hans Christian's tower. He's making measurements here. And we would love to find more about what's going into the boundary layer of the atmospheric transport. Aircraft would be ideal, but they're expensive. They're, uh, they're dangerous to fly 100 feet off the ice sheet um, and weather dependent. So the obvious solution we thought is drones. So we did that, and you'll see this downstairs. This is a, just an off-the-shelf DJI um, octocopter. It can lift about 10 pounds. We designed a sample pod to go underneath it that looks something like this with glass, glass. Because that glass is really the only substance that can measure, take measurements of atmospheric air, store that water vapor in uh, stable conditions so that I can measure it on the late, on Picaro later. We tried Tevlar, Kevlar, we tried stainless steel, we tried all sorts of containers and glass is really the only thing that works. So it's kind of a bummer because it's heavy, and it's expensive, and it's fragile, mm -hmm. but it works. Um, so last year with the proof of concept, with the, this is funded by an eager grant from NSF, thank you very much, we were able to um, look at these variables uh, looking at relative humidity and specific humidity and temperature and potential temperature over altitude on different days. And so we were learning about the structure of the atmosphere and where does the boundary layer set up and how does it change over time. And then we were able to sample in class at different altitudes and actually um, find gradients and help define them. So we collected a sparse amount of data last year enough to, our, to prove ourselves that this worked. The catch was that multi-rotor that you'll see downstairs relies on a compass. And for 90% of the drone use in the world, 
that's just fine. GPS may come and go, but it needs a compass to, to know its attitude. Well, up there, the field lines, of the you're so close to the magnetic pole that the field lines are <coughs> dipping, and it's a weak field, and the compass goes, there's a magnetic disturbance. I don't know what to do. I'm going to give up navigating. And it'll spin, like 1,500 feet above your head, you can spin, and then pick directly go. Oh, I wasn't great for last year. <laughs> this, I mean, yeah. Let me get a little butt right here, I think. Um, and so while it worked, we were able to painstakingly do this. It was really nerve wracking. And I was on the phone with people in China, and they're like, you know, they did, they've never seen this. It's like, no one flies at 75 north and in minus 25 degrees, the batteries and all this stuff. So we came back, and it was kind of in our plan from the, from the get go, but we wanted to evolve to a fixed wing. And I'll show you more about that later. It's way better. So the ultimate goal for a lot of these measurements will be help, able to help ground truth a lot of the uh, global climate models that incorporate isotopes. So we can give them some actually real data. And that's a lot of what we do in the lab downstairs is we're providing ground truth, basically the real data that people have to match with models. So the fixed wing, which I don't have on display because it's in Greenland, is made by a company here in Boulder called Black Swift. Um, it's a phenomenal platform because it's so modular and uh, adaptable. So from here back is from them, and then from here forward is anything you can dream up that'll fit in a nose cone and weigh less than five pounds. And it has a power connection here, and these four rods, two buttons, and away you go. So we have three of these nose cones with a quiver of glass flasks and manifolds, little computers to open and close valves. And, um, I did this with the help of uh, Dirk Richter, who's part of INSTAR, who, who's a brilliant engineer, works in SOLIDWORKS, and helped us design this. And uh, the result was um, <coughs> what we came up with here. You can see the nose cone. This is on a launch rail. This is a pneumatic launcher. So this compressor here works for about 10 minutes to fill this giant tank here to about 150 PSI. And then it's like you've seen pictures of fighter jets on aircraft carriers where they launch. This instantaneously releases all the pressure in the cylinder to a tube inside this rail that has a piston that goes driven down here. It's attached to a cable, it's attached to a carriage that pulls this off at six Gs, and away it goes. And I think I, this might work. Let's see. thing is, we don't have to be pilots. It is so programmed. So when it's flying, it's just going to a pre-programmed uh, orbit. So it has a, a pro on a tablet, you say, launch and go here. And it waits until you tap somewhere else on the tablet and say, go there. Or you have a pre-programmed ascent of uh, profile. Or you can tell it to mow the lawn if you want to use it for a photogrammetry application. This is like a game-changing earth science tool. And it's relatively affordable. Um, 35K for the launcher, the, everything. And um, the nearest competitor I found was 60K. Um, but what this does, it'll fly for like, at these temperatures, and our altitude here, about an hour and a half. Up there, we get about an hour, a big cool temperature. Um, we have been flying to 15,000 feet. And we have, uh, we're in, uh, we're permitted by the Greenland Air Command, and they're equivalent to the Danish FAA. To do that, they've created a safe uh, restricted flight zone for us, and uh, it's a NOTAM, so it's on commercial airline lines. They know that bad things happen there, stay away, and uh, we have to call every day and tell them we're flying, but they'll let us go that height. So I don't think we'd get away with that in the States so easily, but um, for a lot of photogrammetry applications, you can fly lower, but we're, we're up about 14,000 feet. So what have we learned from these flights? We have a really good sensor that gives us wind, speed, direction, temperature, relative humidity, pressure, and we can plot these. So here's uh, just a flight that was in earlier this June. Um, the blue, this is in Kelvin here, so we have um, warmer, colder temperatures, so it's actually, you can see it's getting um, warmer with altitude here, and um, you can plot these uh, heights of specific humidity and potential temperature, and you can actually see that uh, uh, boundary layer really pops out of the air. So what we do is we send this data back real time to the aircraft. We're plotting it real time on the laptop so we can sort of, in our ascent, we can sort of say, oh, okay, 
here's the boundary layer, so let's sample above and below it to kind of nail this gradient. And it helps us uh, with uh, an informed strand sampling strategy. So um, that's what the crew is doing right now. They're flying as many flights as they can. Um, we already had one crash. Uh, this was like a hole in one. Um, you tell it where to land on your tablet. And the problem is that normally you fly around here, the tablet will pull up Google Earth and show you where all the obstacles are in the buildings. You can say, all right, land in that lawn out there and you'd be fine. The map of Greenland is white. And all the obstacles are man-made and they, they, they're moving <laughs> at 16 meters a year. And so I had some photogrammetry that showed the layout of the camp in the KMZ file, learned it to Google Earth. I thought, okay, great, we know where the dome is, we can find it. And I went, wait a minute. And I put the current location of the dome, the GPS on Google Earth, and it was 66 meters off. So I thought, well, this isn't gonna work. So what we have learned to do is we, we land in areas where we kind of just go out and map ourselves and we did this sort of religiously. The trouble with the camp is there's a lot of peripheral things like remote weather stations that are just out in the middle of nowhere. And one of our landing zones came down and it was skidding to a stop and like 10 feet before it was ready to stop, smacked into a pole that had a remote weather station. It was like playing putt-putt golf and you know, <laughs> from here to you know, the road down there and getting a hold of one. So uh, camp water wings did not very well, but uh, I quickly was able to dispatch parts to them. On the next one of my flight, we only lost like six days. So uh, we're back in action. But um, <coughs> I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll answer any questions. And then um, our plan will be to kind of we'll troop downstairs to the lab. And we have uh, plenty of time down there. Um, and we can maybe take a detour for those of you who want coffee. Um, and then we'll you'll see firsthand uh, how the instruments are in the lab, and we'll divide into two groups. One group will stay with me, we'll talk about ice cores and some ancillary stuff. Another group will go with Sylvia Michelle, who's our second command in the lab, and she'll tell you all about our greenhouse gas uh, measurement program with NOAA. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. How many of these blades do you have? Sorry? How many of these blades do you have? Planes? Drones. drones. Is it drones? Well, we have multi rotor, and then we have the fixed wing, and the odd thing is that insurance might cover my, my parts, and with maybe a modest little investment of another fuselage, I might have two fixed wings when we're all done. But uh, really just one with multiple nose cones for now. Questions? I'm trying to get my mind around this. <clears throat> Your camp is moving 16 meters. No, uh, or about 60 meters a year, 66 meters, something like that. All right, so the tunnel, everything, that's all moving. Do they, do parts of it move at different rates? Do you have like cracks in the tunnel? Um, on a local scale, not so much. On a bigger scale, yes. If you go out maybe, I don't know, 10K in either direction, you'll find slower moving ice. So there's sheer margins that are out there. And um, if you go down, down Glacier far enough, you'll find crevasses. And in fact, we had a Basler, which is a sort of a DC-3 tail dragger from the 1940s, which they re reworked at the um, Alpha Vega in Germany has two of these, four or five, four or six, and they're sort of small versions of the C-130 that can land. They were going to take a crew out to do a shallow core, and they flew over an area and said, nope, we're not landing, they're crevasses. So not that far from our camp, it's crevasse, and that's because of the difference of the ice velocities. But locally in camp, we're all kind of moving together. What's all these equipment in the trench? Does it, all this energy, does it change the temperature Great question, really great question. Um, the, if you go down, and we're down so maybe 15 meters or so below the surface, uh, most, and in there you'll find the average annual temperature is about minus 28 or so. I mean, that's what the ice sheet is. So, um, it gets colder in the winter, obviously, warmer in the summer. Um, and we like to maintain that, so when the ice comes out of the hole, it's not subject to a thermal shock. This is really important for the brittle ice zone. You guys talked about brittle ice yet? A little bit? Yeah. So it's this really interesting phenomenon. I have a whiteboard here, but basically, <coughs> all the bubbles we talked about in the fern column getting compacted, um, as they get compacted further and further down the core under greater and greater pressure, that air is getting squished. And so the pressure in that bubble gets pretty high. And 
there's a zone we call the brittle ice zone, and usually it's around 600 meters to about 1,200 meters, where those bubbles are still air bubbles. Um, and below that depth, they're under such great <coughs> pressure, those bubbles are forced into the crystal lattice. They're actually dissolved into the, the solid ice. Now the gases are still there, but you pull up the ice and it's just beautiful, crystal clear. Above it, it's kind of cloudy because of the bubbles. So what happens when we bring that brittle ice, zone, uh, ice from 600 to 1200 meters up to the surface, that gas is seeing atmospheric pressure for the first time. It wants to just So you just touch the ice core, it'll turn into poker chips. So we've learned over the years that for the brittle ice zone, you try to keep it cold, and you actually put it in netting, try to keep it cozy together, and then you set it aside to relax for a year. It has a little vacation. It just hangs out in the trench for a year, and then next year it's a little more equilibrated and relaxed, and we can cut it with less chance of breaking. But to answer your question, when we're drilling that brittle ice zone, we actually refrigerated a core processing logging box so it could, it could stay at minus 35. So that when the ice came out, it could stay cold as long as possible while we cut it into the chunks. And throughout the, throughout the season, we try to exhaust any heat from humans up to the surface and keep it as cold as possible. But the equipment that you used, you know, all the computers and the, because you have to use it, you use energy, and that should heat up. Yep. So should you have some heat? In there? All the energy eventually goes to heat, and um, the computers obviously have to be in a warm place. So we have these modular freezer rooms. They're meant to be like freezers, but we put keep the warm and the people in them, and then the trench is cold. So we have like a little warm box you go in, and it can get with the instruments, it can get to be like you know tank top kind of temperatures in there, and we have to vent the heat out through a stack, through a chimney. And, um, but it is a problem, and it'll be a problem this year, as throughout the season, it gets warmer on the surface, that heat penetrates the trench, and it's not good for the ice. You're right. Just one question. Uh, Gary and I are gonna talk this afternoon, <coughs> Gary Klaus, an engineer, and he and I are gonna talk this afternoon about that marriage of science and engineering. Yeah. And when you talked about developing, you said we developed the um, instrument that I think was under the drone. Yep. Does that include engineering or did the scientists design that themselves? For better or worse, the scientists were involved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only a uh, plain engineer on TV or whatever, but I know just enough to be dangerous. And we, Jim and I, have over the years created a lot of our prep systems and picked up little skills along the way of milling machine, whatever. Nowadays, it's all, we rely on people like Dirk Richard and SolidWorks. Um, one of the things that made it possible was I bought a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of an investment in the future. It's like, oh, this could be novelty. And people were excited about making puzzles and all these little trinkets. And I was like, really? <laughs> but what it did is it gave us some proficiency of this. And so when it came to make the drone, that thing paid for itself in spades because we made all of the bulkheads out of a uh, really lightweight honeycomb material that we printed right in the lab. So things have changed. Um, you don't really have to do stuff anymore. It's just have good designers. 3D printers. Mm -hmm. so, it is the future. <clears throat> how, do you, how do you choose the location for the corn? Ah, Jim could probably speak to that as well or better than I, but over the years, the, obtaining a paleoclimate record has been our goal. I should say in the early days, like Camp Century, if you've heard about that, the military experiment in way northeast Greenland, northwest Greenland, and even the, some of the first real major paleoclimate ice cores from Greenland, southern Greenland, died three were chosen because of logistics. Like, we have some of the reason to go there for like a defense early warning site. And like, yeah, you guys can drill a nice car as long as we have planes there, yeah, sure, okay. And so they're not, they weren't chosen with the ideal site in mind. Nonetheless, we got some pretty interesting data from them. And then later on, um, sites were chosen uh, with regard to getting a, a better record. And uh, I started my ice coring career with <coughs> Jim in 1990. Actually, I started before that with USGS, but when I came here, we were involved in what was called the GIST II project. You probably heard that, maybe. And GRIP was an American project at the summit of Greenland. And then about 30 kilometers away was the RIP project. And sort of a collaborative, competitive thing. The idea being that we both drilled an ice core and measured a record. We got the same answer. We believe it. Um, and we were all kind of in 
search of Enion, like a period about 125,000 years ago where CO2 levels were elevated and we think might be an analog for kind of what we might be seeing today, that has remained rather elusive to get a good record that's not that's not been folded or sort of somehow compromised by the flow. Because once you get close to the bedrock, things are flowing over uneven surfaces and like a river in turbulence, the ice gets a little mixed up. And so uh, we've, we've tried to chase it at uh, Griff, North Griff, uh, Neem, North Emian, and now East Griff. <laughs> so it's been a little bit of an elusive beast, but it's out there. And I will say that in Antarctica, there's even older ice. Um, and there's a push now for the oldest ice by many, many groups. Uh, the French and the Australians are chasing it, and uh, we hope the US will as well. Um, there's probably a million year old ice down there, and we're going to get it. How old is the oldest that you guys have pulled out of here? What did you say, Joe? 150? Um, that's about 160,000. Is that the one we were holding yesterday? <laughs> no, we were holding 500. I would have No, 500 years. 500 years. Oh, I got some older ice that my green down <laughs> I have a, a quick question um, relating to more the air quality. Sure. Where you're doing them, and I don't know if, if someone from uh, the Colonel Board is looking at. Um, I assume with all the instrumentation and everything, and just by the activity you're producing particles, and I'm just wondering, some of them might be a good ice to add and maybe affect the snow production, precipitation production. Yep. Is there any thought about it or, or any oh, consideration? Yep. It's a classic example of the Heisenberg principle. We can't really analyze something without being part of the experiment ourselves. Exactly. So we try to mitigate that by um, uh, any of our snow studies. Uh, fortunately, the wind comes from a prevailing direction, um, 240, and almost always. And so anything upwind is pristine and, and is uh, off limits. We don't go there. And so all of our snow sampling and air sampling instruments see that air or blown snow. And then we also have sacred areas for our drinking water. Um, we actually thought about having dogs in camp as a polar bear warning uh, system, but snow quality was an issue. Mm -hmm. And also they don't always, uh, once people show us pictures of dogs and polar bears kind of cuddling and sort of having fun together, we have, well, that doesn't work. <laughs> we actually, uh, little side note, we have had two polar bear visits in the last three years. I'm not a polar bear scientist. I don't know if it's, because I think that some studies will show that polar bears are doing pretty well, despite our concern. Um, but I would say their habitat is getting, is being compromised, and their hunting areas are being compromised. So I don't know if they're just wandering further up the ice sheet in search of food, and then they get, they have really good noses, and they probably just get a whiff of, oh, the barbecue is tonight. I'll go there. And we're 400 kilometers from and by the time they show up there, they're hungry. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, you're the only one around, they're, they're not leaving. Mm -hmm. Your garbage, your food, and you are potential dinner. And so the sad story is you have no choice. And we have worked with Greenland authorities to know that we have the permission to do that. We have to take them down. So that's really sad. I got my ears open. But, um, you can't steer them or they won't move. garbage downwind, so that the bear comes upwind, smell us, that's the first thing you see. And then we also have a uh, recently declassified defense radar, so it's not your average marine radar. It's, uh, it looks out about five kilometers and sweeps, and we have friendly zones, and like one on the ski way, where there's flags that are moving, you do a false positive, it will detect motion, and it detects uh, field <coughs> the zone, so you have movement, it gives it a vector and a location, and they can look at the speed and say, that's a flag, or, oh, that's something else. Blow the horn, get everybody in the dome, go to the protocols, and, uh, uh, yeah. oh. but it's, um, it's really sad, but that's my person, all Greenland, I've trained to be around polar bears and up in the ice sheet, we never thought we'd ever have to train for them. Now we did. Any difference than the luminous flies in Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture of the balloon I want to show you making trenches. So that's how they do it. So they deflate the balloon and then you've got this left over and then you fill it.
programming. How much of the snow is about to go You know, when you start out here, it's not that much, and they'll blow it up into a mountain. So you can start with just as little as you know, a few meters, then it, every year it gets more and more snow on it. But I would say, I'm not an engineer, but I would say for strength, you know, a couple of meters, you're probably good. I was wondering, um, what kind of, well, two things, what kind of precautions um, you all do as scientists to make sure you're not you know, interfering uh, with those systemic changes and, and, and the environment that might be contributing or impact on what it is you're seeing? Um, has there been any try to leave nothing behind. Obviously, the original tree in our house, that, that's left behind, I'm not taking that list. But other than that, we pretty much leave it pristine. Um, I will, that said, um, carbon footprints are an issue. Climate scientists, at least in Ohio, are probably, we're probably some of the worst, because uh, it's an international <coughs> activity, and we like to talk to each other. We fly to different places a lot. These C-130s are on the ground. I don't have the number in my head, but when they're sitting there idling on the ground, the gas gauge is just going. These are powerful gas-consuming things. That's like, yeah, being there is, we're, you know, that carbon footprint expenditure, we feel is worth the science we're getting. So it's a trade-off we make. But in terms of contamination, um, there is a whole cottage industry of biologists who have been looking at things in ice cores that sprouted up in the last couple decades. And uh, so when we get down to the bottom, we're really careful about you know, cleanliness and sort of what might come up. Like when they drilled Lake Vostok, they tried to make sure that the probe that went in there was not contaminated, not bringing bacteria to the surface that they would wrongly interpret as being part of the lake. So yeah, there's real issues. <laughs>